Randomness causes addiction, and that's something my dad taught me. People become addicted to random rewards. Hey, podcast listener, you're about to discover insider tips, tricks, and secrets to making more sales and converting more prospects into customers with email marketing. For more information about the email marketing podcast or the autoresponder guy, go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast. Hey guys, uh, it's John McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy, and it's time for episode 76 of the Method Email Marketing Podcast, where you'll discover one simple thing, how to make money every time you send an email to your list, which is really, I think, the goal here, is we want to learn how to take the email addresses that we have on our email list and make them buy stuff. You know, and It's not because we're just trying to make money or we're trying to scam anyone, it's because we're trying to help people, because email is a way to build a relationship with people. So, it's good to have you here. Today, I'll be talking to Bond Halbert. Now, you might recognize that last name, and the reason why is that Bond is the son of the late Gary Halbert, one of the greatest copywriters. Gary was one of the greatest copywriters who ever lived, okay? Now, you might have read the Bon, I think it's the Bon letters, the Boren letters. That's right. I think he was so, Gary was writing it out to his sons. Anyway, go check that out if you can. The Boren letters, they're good. Anyway, today we're going to talk about how to create an engaged list. And I was very interested to talk to Bond about this because of his experience with, obviously, he started learning this marketing stuff when he was, I think, I think he's either said 10 years old or four years old. Crazy, crazy, you know, really, really young at the time. And so he's just grown up, born and bred by marketing. So it was great to get him on and, and talk about some of this stuff. And I was surprised, to be honest. It's made me rethink and challenge some of my ideas and my ways of doing email. And I think over the next few months, as I update my own business and my own sort of marketing funnel, things are going to change based somewhat on what uh, what I've learned from Bond. And there's, I've got another guy coming up next week who also will be talking about a similar thing. Now, to get the show notes for this episode of the Email Marketing Podcast, Go to the McMethod.com slash 76. Now, this week's McMaster's Inside of the Week is a good one. And this is something I've been sharing on some of the webinars I've done with people. And uh, this is something you can take away right now as an insight and go and apply in your business. And I think you get some great results with it. Okay? So, split testing the price. Now, I found in the last few months, the single biggest thing that I can do uh, in terms of split testing is split testing the price. So changing the price from $7 to $17, $17 to $25 or $29.95. And uh, it's, it's incredible to see the conversion rate difference. Because sometimes I found, for example, I went from $7 on one product to $17 and the conversion stayed the same. Okay, absolutely, you know, incredible. Then I went up to 20, I did try uh, $19.95, that didn't really work. $24.95 didn't really work. $29.95 was interesting, but I think $17, if you blow it out through the upsells, if you sort of have an expanded view, uh, $17 works better because it has a slightly higher conversion rate, which means there's more front end customers, which then means more people buy the upsells. Okay, so it's absolutely fascinating. So split testing the price, the really simple way to do this, create a couple different PayPal buttons, sign up to Visual Website Optimizer and set up a, uh, basically a test. Grab it, you know, create two pages of your sales page. One has one price, one has the other. Split test them with your traffic and uh, you will be astounded at the results. Maybe a couple of them, a couple of tests, you don't find out much. But uh, a good friend of mine, a conversion rate guy, conversion, opt- conversion, was it CRO, conversion rate optimization guy, he's fond of saying that, you know, eight out of 10 tests won't do anything. They won't make a difference, right? You'd be better off going with whatever you started with. But the one or two that you find occasionally that take a bit of work to get to, they are just pure gold because they would, you know, they'll just change, uh, bump things by massive amounts, okay? So the lesson here, go and test your price. If you haven't tested, go and test your price. If you're a freelancer, just start, double your rates. Hell, quadruple your, quadruple your rates and see what happens. See what people say and you'll be surprised, especially, you've got to say it confidently though, okay? You've got to have some confidence. Uh, the other reason I'm excited about McMaster's right now is I've mentioned this before in the last couple of weeks, his templates, there is a whole bunch of fill in the blank templates, 10 to be exact, inside McMaster's so that anyone can join and be up and running with their autoresponder with five or 10 emails in literally a couple of hours. And then if they want to, they can go back and start studying the training material, which I highly suggest because then they can go and learn how to write the emails themselves and they won't need to use templates all the time. Okay. Now I love templates. Templates make things easy. They remove the challenge of, you know, writer's block and all that crap. So templates inside McMaster's to learn more about McMaster's, whether it's the templates or you want to know what training materials inside there, go to themcmethod.com slash McMaster's. And I hope to see you in there. Now, let's get into this interview with Mr. Bond Halbert. 
It's John McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy. I'm here with Bond Halbert, who is uh, the son of the late Gary Halbert. And uh, I thought I'd get him on the show to talk about some of the stuff he's learned from, uh, I guess, over the last few years and how that's changed from what Gary teaches or taught. And uh, yeah, how that's changed, how that's evolved, and also uh, what he's up to now. Now, Gary Halbert... If you're listening to this, you really should know who he is. He wrote the Gary Halbert Letter. He's one of the greatest copywriters uh, on the planet. And uh, so he's got this Gary Halbert Letter. Every copywriter, a direct response marketer, has been through it at some point to learn from it. You know, some of the issues, all the issues. I went through it back uh, when I was sort of getting things going uh, when I was living in the Philippines. And it was a great resource to just learn. It was so good. Now, you hear it mentioned everywhere. I mentioned uh, in some of the emails that I sent out to my list. And that's still around. And now Bond is actually tweaking it and doing some interesting stuff with it, which I'm sure we'll get into today. Bond, how are you going, mate? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on this. Good to have you on here, man. It's, uh, I think I, I saw you, I heard about you a while ago, back when, you know, two years ago I was living in the Philippines. And uh, that was when I started writing down sales letters by hand, the way um, you know, Gary suggests. And I remember hearing, or well, seeing you there, seeing you somewhere, I found your website, or you and Kevin. And then I think I just got caught up with other things for a while, and then it sort of circled back through a friend of ours, Dan, who said, oh, I know Bond Halbert. I'm like, well, how about we get him on the show for a bit of a podcast, we can talk about marketing. So it's, uh, it's, it's funny how this, it's a bit of a small world. Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing that you know, I mean, you know, they have six degree, you know, six degrees of separation in the marketing world. It seems like it's always one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so before we, I mean, let's just start. I mean, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't plan this out too much. So let's see where this goes. Before we, I guess, get into sort of the meat and potatoes, give uh, people a bit of a background on, uh, you know, who, who is Bond Halbert and what are you up to right now? Well, um, in the marketing community, I'm pretty well known for being, you know, my dad's right hand man for a long time. And so, you know, learning the ropes and copywriting and so forth. But I went off and uh, took what he had taught me and I started selling info products and did quite well with that. And then, and when he passed away, I started to, you know, I actually, t- I tooled down for a while and I just took a lot of time off to kind of, you know, recover from that, the shock of it all, <laughs> I don't want to say. And then um, I got up and had to start retooling and then I found that a lot of people were really, you know, that there were a lot of people who still wanted more info and, you know, they they needed more, sh- you know, a kind of helped pick up the slack and helping teach some people some marketing tricks and some and you know and how basically showing people how to take the Gary Halbert lessons in the letters and especially the older ones and translate and show people the value in it and how it's being used today and so I started falling into kind of like the pattern of teaching people more about marketing through products and services and to and you know consulting and taking clients on and stuff and we have um, also I get you know I do a lot of work and in, in, I'm pulled into a lot of high-level masterminds as an idea guy and stuff because you know, marketing is one of those things where a lot of people picked it up at, you know, 25 or 30 and, you know, then they you know, moved in discovery copywriting and stuff. And so, but when one of the things that you have when you start off as early as I did, because my dad really started training me, not just, you know, I, I mean, I was stuffing and stamping and sealing envelopes for test mailing since I was like two, but he started really training me um, when I was about 10, somewhere around that area. You know, when you have that kind of understanding of it, you, and you hear the lessons as often as I did, and you know them so well, because I was basically... Because my dad taught you anything in the newsletter or he taught any protege in person, I was the original guinea pig for that lesson. And I was the and I was the original guinea pig several times over and I would watch him teach these other people as well. Okay. So when you have that kind of level, what you start to do is you start to see automatic things or you start to understand the core concepts and the psychology that's involved with the techniques he shows you. Right. Yeah. And when you get that, you start to understand how that works and you get to apply it to, you know, let's say the digital age or the just, you know, more modern marketing techniques. And I can give you an example of that. Like in my dad's one of his early newsletters, he has this letter that's all about 900 numbers and 900 numbers for those who don't remember them are numbers where if you call the number, they phone company would then charge the person who called them. So it was a way of charging quickly. Yeah. And for a recorded message. Now, it's like 976 numbers were for porn, <laughs> you know, it's, sex, it's recorded sex talk. But 900 was more for things like horoscope and, you know, a $10 message on the, you know, good homes available, you know, to buy in Los Angeles or whatever the, the process, you know, whatever the information you were selling was. Yeah. 
And a lot of people would look at that and say, well, you know, I could see that hook being used in this, maybe this website or anything, but I'm, I will turn around and say, look, that's perfect for a short text code. You know, when you get a, those five digit codes that say text here to get your horoscope or text here to get your, you know, to make a donation. So all of those lessons translate in that way. And in my dad's online, uh, his APAL, BPAL speech, where he teaches you how to get your snail mail opened and read, I took all those concepts in it and I applied it and started of getting higher opening rates you know opening rates that honest i've heard people at a weber and get response get amazed at you know and if you can if you can impress them you can impress them <laughs> And so I started applying that to autoresponders and email marketing, and it's all the core concepts, but there are some some subtle differences between then and now. So for example, you know, online, the way that the attention span is broken up is is a little bit, you know, you used to, you know, you'd break up your paragraphs for eye relief in an ad, mm. and you do that in print. Online, you have to break it up even further. Okay, and the the funny thing is, it's just that it, you know you want to say things in a, you have a shorter attention span to get to, to people because people value their reading time more than like anything else. You know, if I turn around and I say to you, hey, you know, there's a great new show on TV, you'll give it a half an hour, right? Yeah. If I say there's a cool song, you'll give it a minute to listen to. If I say here's a 12 page sales letter, would you read it? You'll say, let me put this away until after dinner or something, and you'll figure out a way to not read that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it and so and but you know today's fast paced world just gets faster and faster. So a lot of the I think that one of the one of the key differences you know and you'll you'll see it even with copywriters. It used to be that you wanted to write to a fifth grade level education, and now they're even lowering that. They're saying you want to let write in a fourth grade vocabulary. Yeah. And it's not that people are less articulate or you know have a, a slower vocabulary. It's they've got less time and they've got less of an attention span on. Online and so some so in some instances I don't believe in absolutes in marketing in print you can still do the same thing but that you know but if you think about it our parents generation they grew up reading for entertainment so much more than you know our generation right and our genera in the in my my daughter's generation they are reading short short stories they read fan fiction you know Facebook and, status updates yeah and you have to pay attention to that you know to the medium that you're in but anyway so one of the things that I very much focus on is trying to show the people show everybody in the world how the, the what my dad taught can actually st is actually still used today by great marketers and a lot of people are teaching his concepts and some of them are giving him credit for it and some of them aren't <laughs> um, but there, but so much of his stuff in even his words you're seeing used over and over in copy but there's a lot but some of it is just needs that you know that understanding of the psychology behind it to understand why that's working and then how to adapt it right you know I think the interesting part here is that because I was wondering that was one of the things I wanted to ask you is are you just doing direct mail stuff with uh, you know the stuff you've learned from Gary or are you doing it online? So it sounds like you've actually been applying it online, but you've had to sort of update it and tweak it to make it fit. Yeah, well, I'll give you an example. In my dad's APAL, BPAL speech about getting your, your mail opened, one of the first things he did was uh, fix what's, a... Just just before you talk about that, what is the... The listener might not know what that is. So what's the APAL, BPAL idea? Okay, the concept is this. When you when you would come home and get your mail, you would sort it, and you would, you would sort it over a wastebasket. And you would put in, you'd sort it into two piles. Well, really three. There's stuff you just obviously didn't want. You throw it into the trash bin. But you would sort out your letters and all the stuff you had to open, your bills, personal correspondence, and so forth, into one pile, the A pile. And that was the stuff you were going to read for sure. And the B pile was things that you might be interested in, like, you know, here's an offer for an oil change, and I might need an oil change. Let me put that down for a second. And you'd look at it and say, okay, I'm not so sure about this, and you put it in the B pile. But later, what would happen is, you know, you're, you know, the B pile starts to pile up over the week, and, you know, Saturday your friends are coming over to take you to a movie and you're straightening up and you just throw it all into the garbage. And so a lot of the mail just wasn't even opened. And my dad sat down there, sat down when he was having problems and following everybody's advice saying mail bulk rate because you'll get a, you know, make it'll, you need fewer orders to be profitable and all of this stuff. He really invented gun to the head marketing. And he was, this is in the 1960s. He sat down and said, okay, 
you know, Gary, if somebody had a gun to your head and they said they're going to pull the trigger unless you make the sale, what would you differently? And my dad said first, and this is, you know, this is a longer speech as to how it got the mail open, which I won't go into. But he, the, one of the first things he said was I would put in a live first class stamp. And there was two reasons for that. One is it would, you know, one of the keys was getting past the human spam filter, which was the brain. And it was looking at the, the envelope and saying, you know, does this have a window or a bulk rate mailing or anything that indicates this is junk mail, right? And so he didn't want that to happen. So a live stamp was better. But the very first portion of that was actually that first class mail was treated better by the post office than bulk rate mail. He, his first worry was getting the mail delivered. Right. So I was sitting there thinking, what's, you know, the first thing I need to worry about is getting the mail delivered. And everybody in this industry at the time when I first started talking about this was very concerned with spam filters. Right. But here's the thing. If let's suppose that the, this is your average Internet experience, you want something. So for, you know, for example, you want to learn how to cure stage fright. And so you go looking online to find it, and some guy says, I got the seven-step formula, and I'll give it to you free, but you got to give me an email address. So what do you do? You give him a spam email address, right? And, you know, because, and then he says, oh, not so fast. You got to, you know, I need you to click a confirmation link. So you go to that email address, and you see the 500 emails that have piled up there since the last time you were there. You go to the top. You find out if he's either got what you need or he doesn't. If he's got what you need, you're off trying to practice it and do it with the forgotten promise that you will probably resubscribe if he's the right guy, which you never will. Or more than likely, he's actually failed on his promise. He hasn't impressed you, and you're off to the Internet to find your solution. Either way, on the way out, you ignore or delete all 500 emails. Later on that evening, you go to your regular email address, your primary email address, and you see you have a spam filter with 25 to 50 emails in it. Do you just delete them? No. You actually scan them to make sure nobody slipped through the cracks because this is your primary email address. Maybe somebody sent something. Maybe there was an eBay notice, whatever. So you scan it real quick just to make sure that everything in there is spam and then you hit delete. And the lesson here is it would be better for your mail to make it into the spam box of your primary email address than to make it into the primary box of a spam email address. Worry about getting a primary email address before you worry about getting through spam filters. Now, there's a lot of tricks and stuff like that you can go on to learn that will help you get primary email addresses. But that that core concept that my dad was talking about was the right focus on getting your email delivered, right? <laughs> and then the rest of the, you know, the, he used a lot of curiosity to get the email open. And unfortunately, you can't just send a blank on, blank email with a um, to a lot of people. The law will only allow you to send 10 with a blank subject line because they're so powerful that everybody will be forced to open their emails. Oh, you mean you there's know, no subject lines? Yes. So you, yeah, I, have, I've never done it. So you can only, legally, you can only send 10 of them. Yes, because, you know, and so, and it, what will happen is your your ESP won't let you send out more than 10. And everybody's sort of forced to, to look at it. 10 you know? in, in how long? In what sort of time period? Oh uh, well, it's usually at a shot. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, maybe you could hire somebody to sit there and send out one at a time for a while. I don't know. I never tried that, uh, but I don't have to try that because you want to build a relationship with your autoresponders, as you know. So it's better, for, you know, the one thing you don't want is to use cheesy tricks to trick them into opening it. Right. So, for example, the big ones that will always get a boost out of your thing are oops, um, help. You know, these little one word key things that will get people to open it. But you need to save those for the time you actually need it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there trust me, you are gonna send out an email with a broken link. I do it all the time. <laughs> you know, you're gonna you know, you're gonna need the oops and you know, all these little you know, things so that you can, so that you use it when you do, when you do use it, it's not a case of little bo um, the boy crying wolf, right. you know, and getting a you know false result. So the I, I you wouldn't want to do it, but if you're sending it if you're trying to get somebody to open your emails, it'd be like a couple people. You're trying to just get them to make sure they open it. And you have a regular type of email address that's not normally associated with bulk mailing, like a Gmail address and a normal sounding name and everything, and you have a blank e uh, subject line. It's almost impossible not to open that. And it's so it's great to send that if you're trying to get five people to open the email. But if you're trying to do a mass mailing, you know, you know, to 20,000 names, that's that's a lot of work, even if you could get away with it. And I don't think, you know, your, your email service provider is not going to appreciate that much. Right, right. And, and the reason is, the reason is 
the people will open that because they're like, okay, this is blank. I got to find out what it is. And people who have been tricked into opening are much more likely to complain and hit the spam button. So the spam rating goes up. It goes up on the server at your email service provider who's managing all these emails for you. So that server gets tagged as a spamming server and it kind of ruins it for everybody who's mailing through that server. So there's a, there, you know, it's a, it's a karmic payback. Now, if you get people to open your emails through using, you know, good old fashioned, you know, uh, curiosity and benefits and, you know, dark sided, you know, kind of wording and language and everything, but they're very happy with what they've got inside, you don't have a problem. Yeah. You know, the problem is when you leave, you when you, you know, get people disappointed or make them feel tricked. But yes, it's a blank, a blank subject line will do that. And back to what I was saying, the subject line is like forced teaser copy. So the envelopes used to, you know, my dad would, you know, the, all the gurus would say, put on teaser copy and say, you know, great coupon and deal inside and all this other nonsense. And my dad would only put either personal or first class on there. Right. But with the deal with subject lines is they were more like forced subject lines. Right. So uh, there are forced teaser copy is the way that I like to look at them. So, you know, I started looking and applying what he does with headlines and applying all of these things to getting the subject lines that get higher opens and but also lead through to click through rates. Because you remember, it's the bottom line and the dollars that's the most important. So, you know, I will come up with a – I was talking about this earlier actually. One of the subject lines I came up with that I really liked was, thank God my dad went to prison. And it's because my dad, when he actually was sent away for a little while, spent his time writing letters to me proving – and it was the only proof I had of this extraordinary education I had very early because I was 15 when they were written. Yeah. And they were a couple years after I was being educated too. And so I was like – and so – when I say, thank God my dad went to prison, the curiosity and the dark side, everybody's got to know what the heck I'm talking about, right? Then they come in and they see that I'm talking about this book of letters that my dad wrote to me while he was away and how, you know, my reasoning for why I'm thankful for it. Nobody feels like I cheated them or tricked them into opening because I didn't. There was, it's, it, it's congruent. It's, you know, it's continuous and it matches from beginning to the end and I'm still able to tell you about the boron letters and pitch it, Yeah, you know? I think the interesting part with this is that, you know, when it comes to online marketing, so many people get caught up thinking that, like, let's go find this uh, this magical subject line, like the oops, or like the thank you, or like the help. But uh, the the funny part about that, and this is, it's just getting more and more like this, is it's not about tricks, it's really about building a, a solid relationship with the people on that list, which requires you to not use tricks because then they feel tricked. You need to, you know, use a subject line like you just mentioned and then lead into value so that it actually helps them. You know, you actually... <laughs> It's some people might think it sucks, but you actually have to be helpful. That's the funny. Yeah. Part. Well, you know, it, it, the 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 what do people don't understand is online. You have a it's greater relationship building opportunity than in direct mail. Direct mail used to be you mail to them, they'd mail you back, and then maybe you'd mail them again, and maybe three or four products. Right. <laughs> so maybe three or four communications was all you really got in online. You have this ability to build relationships that are much more valuable, not just monetarily, but, you know, overall. OK. And um, and the thing that people forget about copy is copy is just persuasion and salesmanship and print online. It's the same thing, except it's relationship building, which is the same thing as relationship building in person. You meet the guys who do the best job online of building a rapport with their list. They're also people who great building a rapport in person mm. and it's the you know it, and all you have to do is think about it um, in relationship to building relationships like so for example I get asked about timing of autoresponders all the time <laughs> I get the same and, questions, man. People say, "How you know? How often should I send them? How long should my order respond to be?" And yeah, yeah. And I tell them, I say, "Listen, here's first of all, here's what you got to do. You mail at least once a week for a certain period of time until you they will not forget who you are. Because one of the biggest problems you get is people will sign up to your list. You don't mail them in three weeks. They forgot they signed up to your list." And then, you know, you get the spit, you know, you mail to them and then the spam rating goes up and then people complain and then you get de feel dejected and you don't want to mail again until you have something really good to say. So now it's a month and a half before you mail again. <laughs> the situation gets worse and so forth. And pretty soon, you know, I mean, you're like, you're looking and going, oh, this is a 
five percent open rate. <laughs> you know, and you get all dejected, and it's horrible. But the truth is, if you mail something really sensational, the, and, and this is a key. Remember, I didn't give you a specific number of weeks that you should do this, right? Because you could say something that's so fantastic and memorable, like you know, in a single conversation. You and I are not going to forget each other in a week. Right. But if I mail to you once a week for three weeks or four weeks to a point and I give you some really good information, I get to as soon as I'm pretty sure you're going to remember who I am, then I can mail to you when I have something good to say. Right. And if you think and if you think about it, it's not a ba- it's there's you can time things to be on a rel- on a regular basis. If you promise, you know, a sale a day or, you know, a tip a week, you got to mail them once a week minimum. <laughs> you're just delivering on your promise. But every, there is no hard and fast rule with this. There are some people who will mail until, you know, you squeal and get off their list and then they'll try and, you know, even though you're upset with them, send you this, you know, stop and say, hey, do you want to just hear from me once a day? And there are other people who are going to want want you to mail. And they will they will open your mail every single day if you send them a, a new message for a year. But it's it's really about relationship building. And the way I like to look at it is when you're building a relationship, you want to be like the coolest person in their life. And who is the coolest person in your life? It is somebody who you don't get to see all the time. You're not overexposed. Everybody has a certain amount of exposure time. You know, I can spend all day, every day for weeks and months with my wife. That is not true with my brother. That is not true with my friends. That is not, you know, everybody has a certain amount of time that I can stand to be with them. Right. Right. And it's not their fault or even my fault. But the, the coolest person is usually somebody who you really spent quite a, a little bit of time with. They really, you know, improved your life and gave you a lot of value. And this is true with your gurus, too. Think about it. And then you don't really hear from them too often. And then what happens is when they come in, it's sort of like a, rom- a, a randomness. And they come in and they're always full of life and fun. And you just always look forward to it. They're the ones that are the most exciting that you, you know, that's the emails you can't wait to open because those are the friends you can't wait to see. And so there is a, you know, letting the timing ebb and flow more naturally is a better idea than forcing yourself into a formula, in my opinion. And um, and you can, of course, you know, and of course, this is direct response marketing, so you can test everything. You know, <laughs> you know, the, the answer is always in the testing. And I don't believe in any absolutes, um, but I just believe in the beginning. You, the goal is to mail often enough and good enough stuff to be remembered, and then from then on, you can be, you, you know, you can be more dynamic with it. You can change up the timing. You can change up what you're, th- you know, what you're doing, because you know the emails I look forward to are from people who are just, you know, they're full of life. They're always doing something, and there's no way I can predict what's in that email. Yeah. You know, th- those are the ones that are exciting to me. It's a grab bag. And that's the way the Gary Halbert letter was. His letters are addictive. And the reason was when you opened it up and it came in the month, you didn't know if you were going to hear some harrowing tale about him in an airplane or if he was going to tell you the secret to how he built a billion dollar empire or if he was going to tell you how he was down, you know, the, the latest trials and tribulations of his life. He was a warts and all kind of guy. But that ra- randomness causes addiction. And that's something my dad taught me. It's people become addicted to random rewards. So, you know, you wonder, like, if if people become addicted to that kind of random behavior and the, the uncertainty, you know, the shows that you love the most are the ones that you can predict the least. Yeah. You know, as soon as you catch on to the threes company formula is this is always based on some stupid misunderstanding. Every show sucks. <laughs> you know, because you just know the pattern. And, you know, that's another reason I think shows get such a, you know, a, you know, the, so few of them can go. You know, I think the shows that can go forever are the ones that you just can never predict what they're going to do next. And right. they keep people excited that way. Yeah. But, you know, and there's lots of timing formulas and they're, and they're, and they're different per industry. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? How often do you want to hear from your plumber about saving the leaks in your house? <laughs> You know, I mean, that newsletter is not going to have a real long, serious longevity to it. Um, but there are other people who, you know, you want to you want to check in on them as often as they've got something cool to say. So, you know, that the answer always depends. But the one thing I do insist on is mail at least enough or at least cool enough stuff to make sure that you're remembered until the next time you're ready to mail, because not being remembered and who you and what you sent before is the biggest indicator of what you're going to get opened up the next time. It's right. even more important than the subject line. There are some people, it doesn't matter what the subject line is, you're opening their email because of who they are. 
Right, right, right. So right now, I'm feeling a little bit guilty here because I send uh, daily emails. I uh, thanks to I, I learned I got the idea from Ben Settle who he does it as well and uh, people often ask me like you know should they send daily emails and I, I've usually been saying well yeah they I mean I think you can work for a lot of people but now what you're saying is that maybe that's not the best strategy well first of all again I don't believe in absolutes and I'm not saying Ben Settle's wrong here sending emails every day to your list is fine to do especially in the beginning if you have something really cool and you're sending them little short snippets and they feel like they can you know take it in small bites if you sent them a long eight page letter every day you're really hammering that list too much right so it depends on the length of the message and it depends on how long you're doing that if you're doing that for a year straight I guarantee you my open rate after a year is a lot higher than your open rate is after a year but you may have extracted more money remember it's the bottom line it's the dollar that counts mm. um, but in, for my money, what I would rather do is I would rather mail every single day or every other day for a while until I am remembered. And remember, I said at least once a week, right? I wasn't saying that you couldn't mail once a day to make sure you're remembered in the beginning. Uh, but what I would do is start turning into a more random, uh, a, a more random reward type of situation where, oh, wait a minute, I haven't heard from John McIntyre in a little while. This, you know, this should be interesting. Let's we'll see what he's been up to. Whereas if you're just hammering them every single day with a with a new email you got a lot of people who just aren't unsubscribing on your list but also aren't really opening it and aren't really paying attention it you know because it's just impossible it's yeah it's too impossible to be different every single day and to send them something how i mean do you find something so revolutionary cool <laughs> revolutionary and cool that you have 365 new things to talk about over the next year mm. And, you know, so here's the way, the other thing that I think marketers make a mistake in. Apply it to yourself. Who sends an email once a day and you open up every email they send? That you don't, you know, not some, not somebody you know, not some friend of yours. Not, you know, even a marketing guru who's a friend of yours does not count. Yeah. But, you know, some guy who sends an email almost every day and you check them and you basically open them religiously. You know, and, and then look at the people whose emails that are on your list of people you don't know. Again, I'm not going to compare friends and you know people you know but who whose emails like when you get it you say okay I've got to open it no matter whenever he sends it because I don't get them that it's usually because you don't get them that often right. but you know whose emails do you open up all the time and you'll find that the people whose email you open up all the time a lot match a lot more my cool kid theory than a very predictable you know set up an autoresponder that's you know 365 emails long so it sounds like you really need to keep them guessing so you might do daily emails for example you do daily emails for two weeks, then just not say anything for a week, then go back to every two days for a week, and then drop off the radar again and kind of like just always be mixing it up. Yeah, and mix up what you're what you're delivering to. The format, you know, the stories, a, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know what you get when you can, when you get an email from me. You could be getting told about um, a new book that's out. You know, and you could be offered and told about something that we're doing. Or I could be just sending you an off the wall email uh, email marketing tip and just pure content. I could be just handing you Jay Abraham content. I could be doing all kinds of stuff on my Facebook yesterday because yesterday was the, the anniversary of the first uh, issue of the Gary Halbert letter. And so I took a printed copy of it and put it on and put a, took a picture of it, put it on Facebook and said and linked to the site where that copy can be read online. And I said, anybody, everybody who shares this is entered into a raffle to win this printed copy <laughs> that comes from my dad's own personal stash. Now, um, and so uh, 75 people shared it. Right. <laughs> but the thing is, it's it's like Facebook or anything else. On Facebook or social media, you see somebody who, you know, their entire wall is just filled with quotes from other people, and, you know, usually, you know, other famous people, Ben Franklin and Helen Keller and stuff like that. And that's all that's there. You know, you're like, ah, that's boring. Somebody else, they're just constantly telling you about the amazing wonderfulness of their life and how they're just manifesting goodness for everybody that they run into. And then, you know, after 10 or 12 of those, you start to get sick of it, right? Yeah. There's nothing that you don't start to get sick of after 10 or 12 times, right? Yeah. So, but if you're mixing it all up and people don't know what's coming next and you're just and you're being you and you're showing yourself and you're you're not just you know you're not so formulated you know that's one of the pro people think that nobody recognizes a formula and they do they you know there is a you know if you can take a formula from one industry and apply it to the other hmm. quite easily
easily. But when you touch, just take somebody else's formula doing exactly what you're doing, you start to look old hat quickly. Mm. And the example I love to give for this is let's suppose I started a marketing campaign called The Wealthy Bastard, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, everybody knows, hey, that's just the rich jerk, you know, you know, done over again. I don't get the nearly the same play as the guy who did it first. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And so, you know, when you're when you're used to used to the exact same ad formula and the exact same layout on a sales page, sometimes it, they don't all call for the same thing. You know, sometimes, you know, I'll write it much more like an article you'd expect to find on, you know, re replicated on Dig than being more like a WSO type of, you know, right. big buy button at the end and, you know, and which we call and timers and all the other stuff. And there's a place for the timers too. There's a place for all of this stuff, but I don't believe in absolute and I think that that randomness we're talking about goes a long way in your relationship building. Right. One thing I'm curious about, though, is that like if you're just managing a newsletter, you just want to you know maintain a list of relationships so you can continue sending out content and do an occasional product thing. This would work very well. But say you're you've got you know you're running paid advertising to a landing page, and someone signs up, and you want to make that person buy something as fast as possible so you can recoup the spend, uh, you know, what you spend on the advertising dollar on the advertising. Mm -hmm. What's the, you know, are you suggesting do the same sort of strategy or would you do something more aggressive that's really trying to you know, get the money out of them faster? Because it sounds like what you're talking about is take, it, take a bit more time, you know, warm them up, think about it more like a seduction. But when you say you're doing paid advertising, you might want to do it a little bit quicker, right? Well, actually, I think you want to mix the two because autoresponders save the day. Right. And there's no reason that what I do can't be done in an autoresponder. So what we will do is set up an autoresponder so it's mailing at least once a week and then it tapers off. Right. And it, it'll, it doesn't mail once a week. It starts to get more random. And that is a set up system of content and pitch and content and pitch. And the way that you want to do that is this. Um, you do want to you want to do it with upsells more than you want to do it with backup emails. So the, somebody comes in with content and you want to, you know, one of the best ways to do that is just to drive the traffic to something that is a, you know, a lost leader purchase for you. So we drive, you know, we, we spend the money, the ad spend drives everybody to the traffic and it buys the Gary Halbert Letters all-star audio series, let's say. And then they go to buy that. And of course, there's an upsell to it if you, if, you know, you're going in and you're about to buy it and there's an upsell that's there. And I wouldn't put them through the GoDaddy upsell hell. <laughs> you know, if you've ever been through GoDaddy, you know, you try and check out out and it's like 20 pages later <laughs> but you know you you put it you you put them through upsell right there and you want to you know because if they're hot to go they're hot to go and the the key and then you know you decide what to you know your own formula and you play around with it and you give them some content you give them reasons to think that not everything you send is a pitch Okay, and then you know when you when you do mail again and you actually sell them something and pitch something, you can then again upsell them something after they've hit buy in the shopping cart for the first thing. So you're doing a combination of those things, and you're just using the timing of it, uh, the timing of the autoresponders to automatically replicate this process. So you know if we let's suppose we're doing in the formula I'm talking about, we drive the traffic to the Gary Howard Letters All Star Audio Series. They buy that, you know, we get a whopping fifteen bucks from it right so that's you know we can spend fifteen dollars on traffic to get that one sale yeah and then once they're in there and they're now on the list and we upsell them stuff we're talking about the profit okay and then you know we're building the relationship but here's one thing that's very critical we're in a business where we can build a relationship that's worthwhile if you're a plumber that's you know this you know hit them up for the money right away yeah Okay, hit them up while they're doing that. Get them on their list, but you know you're going to be mailing them infrequently. Um, you're going to mail them a couple of quick things real quick and tell them that. Say, I'm going to mail you a couple things real quick, and you'll get this and this and this over the next three days. But then after that, you're only going to hear from me. You're going to get seasonal reminders of things to do, like you know how to you know hey it's it's you know I'll send you a system that will send you a, that the temperature is getting down to 32 degrees, and so you want to crack open your pipes so they don't freeze. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. And then, you know, you give them that kind of excuse or reason to be on your system and then you can do it. So it really also depends on what you're selling and what your business is as, as well. If you're doing uh, teaching people marketing, it's a lot longer longevity. You know, so for us, it's easier to, you know, go ahead and wait a week and give you some more content and some more goodness. And then, you know, before springing something else on you that you didn't know about, you know, or, or give you another offer. Right. 
Right. So again, I don't believe in any absolutes. The only the only thing I'm saying for sure is mail often enough and find an excuse to make sure you're memorable in the beginning because who you are and what you've mailed before is critical to getting your future emails opened. Interesting. Okay. Cool, man. Well, that's that's we're just basically just right just right over time right now. So. Oh. Yeah, Sorry we, about that. No, no, that's, that's all good, man. We we, we kind of filled that up pretty good, I think, for for no plan at all. Okay. <laughs> Uh, before we go, though, we, we, you mentioned uh, the Gary Halbert, this all-star series. Tell me about that. Okay. What we did was th- – I had this idea, and it's not a, ge- it's not a stroke of genius So, because I don't think it's an original idea. I just happened to have it and be in the power to do something about it. But I was, we were talking about after releasing the Born Letters about how you know people just like stuff in different formats. And what we really know everybody wants is to be able to listen to the Gary Halbert letters – being read to them in their car at the gym. So we were just about to sit down and start reading the letters. And then I was like, wait a minute, why don't we get copywriters to each read a letter, you know? So then it came down to us and, you know, and let them add commentary, whatever they want. And so I picked up my phone book and I ran through it real quick. And, you know, first name that really popped out of me was Joe Sugarman. And so I called him up and he said yes. And uh, from that point, we were off to the races. I started, you know, just, you know, I got, I lined up and sent out emails to a bunch of copywriters that I could get a hold of that I knew had a lot of talent, a lot of stuff to add, a lot of respect for our father and his legacy and what he's done and I just emailed a bunch of them expecting you know a few of them to come through and do this for us and what we got back was nothing short of incredible it's the only copywriting product I've seen in my entire lifetime that has actually given me goosebumps when I started to listen to it right it, I mean and I've been around this business for a long time and when you hear these legends you know Gary Benzavinga out coming out of retirement probably you know one of the greatest copywriters left on the planet <laughs> He's, um, you know, all these guys, Carlton, uh, Dale, Deutsch, Garfinkel, Gerber, you know, they're all big top selling, either either all number one best selling authors. There's nobody on there that's not responsible for a million dollars in sale minimum. That's like, <laughs> if, the, if there's somebody in there that's not responsible for way more than that, I would be shocked. Uh, that isn't responsible for more than that, I'd be shocked. But what they they added was these co- the context and explanations of the letters and behind the scenes stories in some cases. And they gave you a new perspective so the people who didn't who are new to the letters are going to get much more out of it than the people who originally just read them and the people who read them now get it to look at it in a whole new light and we threw in a couple uh, we threw in a letter that was never posted before on the website so you know there's a lot of people who would you know get a kick out of that but there are things like you know in the letter I read my dad mentions these hidden lessons inside that issue of his newsletter and I go on and explain seven of them and point them out and highlight them and explain what he, you know, what those lessons are. And they are straight up Gary Halbert lessons. <laughs> yeah. And so we put that all together. And then um, we've got Dan Kennedy, you know, and the names you don't know, like Paris Lompropolis and uh, maybe actually Scott Haynes and stuff like that. These, these are some of the most talented, you know, as John Carlton would say, in the trenches working copywriters. And they're sharing insights and secrets. And, you know, I mean, several of these commentaries are worth the entire price of the series alone, which is only $30. (laughs) You know, it's so ridiculous. You know, and that was just because we are put it on iTunes. Now, you can also go and get it from GaryHalbertLetter.com or Halbertizing with an S because we have it set. We found out later that people on um, iTunes is a great distribution channel, except for there's a lot of people who really don't like iTunes because they, <laughs> they charge double in Australia or they're on Android phones. So we do have, you can find it either ways. But, you know, we put it on iTunes, so we put it in at iTunes pricing. You know, we put, we made it like two albums and, you know, because they're so long, you know, with seven seven rock stars on each and, you know, made the series out of it. And so it really is a, it's, you know, it's something I'm exceedingly proud of. And everybody who's on it has been really proud to not only be a part of it, but um, to get the chance to honor our father and what he did and what he meant to them. But it, this is a, as Brian McLeod likes to put it, it's a whole, the new way to experience the Gary Halbert letters. And it's actually an improved way. And that was, you know, the reason I'm proud of it is, you know, how do you not touch the original and still improve it? So we found that way by, you know, having these guys read it in its original format 
Yeah. And then just adding commentaries and explaining, you know, what it meant to them, the value, the insights had, how the lessons can be translated and all that kind of stuff. And and we're just getting started. You know, if you don't see your favorite copyright on the list, well, you know, I have a long list of people to invite who don't even know that I'm going to invite them. I've got some people on the list I've never even spoken to that I plan to invite. So they're, you know, this has been a huge hit. There's nobody who's listened to them and hasn't been amazed at what's on there. But this is going to be an ongoing thing and we're just going to continue to get more more and more great copywriters to re- until we're done with the, all the letters and we've got a lot of letters to get through <laughs> well cool man so, I'll, I'll have links that's at the garyhoward.com slash stars right the garyhoward.letter.com okay. forward slash stars that's it cool. yeah he made that that url so long <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> kevin jokes because somebody was complaining about his short personal aol email address he's like oh you can spell out kevin at the garyhoward.letter.com and they're like okay never mind <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'll have a link to that at the show notes at themcmethod.com. So if you want to get the link, they can go there. Or you can just type it in if they can uh, remember. GaryHalbertLetter.com forward slash stars. Thank you. Fun, man. Thanks for coming on the show, man. It's been good to talk about email marketing. That's oh, great. Anytime you want to talk about it, just hit me up. I love it. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you want to discover more insider tips, tricks, and secrets about driving sales with email marketing, sign up for daily email tips from the autoresponder guy. Go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast, sign up, confirm your email address, and I'll send you daily emails on how to improve your email marketing and make more sales via email. You'll find out why open rates don't matter and the seven-letter word that underlies all effective marketing and much more. Oh,